order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Tim Lawton. Prime Minister. I have been asked to reply. My right honourable friend, my, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is today with other world leaders in Portsmouth to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings. That operation involved. Oh, this this this, this uh, uh, event today will involve more than uh, 4,000 personnel in D-Day events in the United Kingdom and in France, and it will involve representatives from every country that fought alongside the United Kingdom in Operation Overlord and, appropriately, our former adversaries as well. And I'm sure that members right across the House will want to join me in paying tribute to the sacrifice of those who fought to secure the liberty and peace that we enjoy today and for the courage that made possible then the restoration of democracy, human rights and the rule of law to our continent of Europe. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am sure also that the whole House will want to join me in sending our very best wishes to our Muslim constituents here in the United Kingdom and to Muslims around the world celebrating Eid al-Fitr. I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others earlier today, and I shall be having further such meetings later on today. Tim Lawton. Yeah. Mr Speaker, as the Chancellor says, today in Portsmouth and tomorrow in Normandy, we honour the veterans and the 150,000 British, American, Canadian and other Allied troops who led the charge to liberate <laughs> Europe against the real Nazi scum. So does my right honourable friend agree that when a minority of hate fuelled demonstrators yell Nazi scum in the faces of American tourists and intimidate others legitimately welcoming the visit of the American President, however we may take issue with him, and regrettably spurred on by certain honourable members of this House, yeah, yeah, yeah. that they attack yeah. the greatest <laughs> alliance of free nations and they demean the memory of those brave troops and veterans whose very sacrifice secured the yeah, right of all of yeah. us to free speech Mr Speaker, I agree with every word that my honourable friend has just said, and I think that it, it's worth reminding ourselves that the, the fact that we and our neighbouring countries uh, across the Channel enjoy today the freedom to express our views publicly, to assemble and to demonstrate our points of view, to argue peacefully against one another in this place, are derived from the courage and the sacrifice of the wartime generation, whether from the United Kingdom or the United States of America or our other allies. And we should remember and salute that courage and that sacrifice and not demean it by the sort of disgraceful behaviour to which my honourable friend referred. Rebecca Long Bailey. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and it's a pleasure to be stepping in on behalf of my colleagues today and indeed to be opposite the right honourable gentleman. And might I echo his comments made regarding the marking of the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landing which are being commemorated today in Portsmouth. We must never forget the extraordinary sacrifices of all those who landed that day in Normandy and the achievements of our service men and women who came together to fight fascism and protect our freedom. I'd also like to wish an Eid al-Fitr to all of our Muslim friends right across the United Kingdom. And I also want to express solidarity to all women fighting pension injustice in court and outside Parliament today. I'd also like to congratulate both English teams who competed in the Champions League final on Saturday. And as a Man United fan, it pains me to congratulate <laughs> Liverpool on their victory. Although, although fair play, fans did rename Margaret Thatcher Square in Madrid Jeremy Corbyn Square. And I reckon that deserves brownie points, even from a Man United fan. <laughs> Mr Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister had to repeat to President Trump a journalist's question about whether the NHS is on the table as part of a US trade deal. 
Given the Prime Minister was silent on the matter, perhaps the right honourable gentleman could clarify the government's position. Will the Tory party give US companies access to the NHS, yes or no? Well, can I, can I first of all welcome the, uh, the honourable lady to uh, these new responsibilities for her and to uh, agree with the uh, comments she made both about D-Day and about the success of English football teams in the recent uh, uh, two European Championships and also um, to uh, wish well to both the English and Sco Scottish women's eleven for their forthcoming matches. Um, I I, 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 well, I welcome the Honourable Lady. I, I, I feel slightly sorry for the uh, Right Honourable Lady, the member for Islington South, who I'm used to, to jousting with, who, who seems to have been dispatched to internal exile somewhere else along the front bench. And, you know, it's uh, perhaps it's just my. my, my you know, the, the, the Honourable Lady perhaps needs to, to watch out because I think there's a lesson there that. Anybody who at the dispatch box outshines the dear leader risks being, air <laughs> risks being airbrushed out of the Politburo history at the earliest opportunity. The My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has been very clear and she, he, she spoke for everyone in the government and on this side of the House, when it comes to trade negotiations, the NHS is not and will not be up for sale. Rebecca Long Bailey. He's full of the banter today, Mr. Speaker. Well, the President certainly seemed to think the NHS was on the table yesterday. So does the Trade Secretary. But who knows who speaks for the government at the moment? And the Prime Minister did nothing to allay concerns yesterday. So I hope. She was more forceful in raising climate change, with a president who initiated the US withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, opened up record amounts of land for oil and gas drilling, and called climate change a hoax. Can the right honourable gentleman confirm if yesterday the Prime Minister made any attempt to convince him that climate change is in fact real? Um, uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. The, my right friend, the Prime Minister, did raise climate change with uh, the President yesterday, and she made clear at their joint press conference yesterday afternoon that that is what she had done. We are very proud of this country's commitment to the international agreements to reduce global carbon emissions, and we have a better track record in reducing those emissions than any other G7 member state. Long Bailey. Speaker, the statistics that the Right Honourable Gentleman referred to relates to emissions cuts since 2010, when the UK benefited from policies put in by the last Labour government, policies which have since been dismantled. But how much authority does this government actually have on this issue? Three current cabinet ministers have denied the scientific consensus on climate change, and several of those standing in the Tory leadership contest have close links with organisations and individuals promoting climate denial. Mr Speaker, it does not bode well. Figures released in April show that the UK is set to miss its own carbon budgets by an ever-widening margin. Would the right honourable gentleman like to explain why the government is off track to meeting its own targets? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we're, we're, we're not off track uh, towards uh, meeting those targets at all. Since 2010, since 2010 the United Kingdom has decarbonised our economy faster than any other G7 country. We generate now a record amount of electricity from renewable energy sources, and we have just gone through the longest period in our history without relying on electricity generated from coal. That stands rather starkly against what appears to be the Labour Party's declared policy, which is to reopen the coal mines, but not actually to burn the coal that they mine. Mr Speaker, the Labour Party does not condone the reopening of any coal mine to be used for energy purposes. And once again, once again, Mr Speaker, he refers to climate emissions reductions that were implemented 
implemented using Labour Party policy, Labour policies that have since been dismantled. And not only is the government failing to meet its targets, but last year actually saw the smallest drop in carbon emissions in the last six years, just 2%. At that rate, it would take until the end of the century to reach net zero emissions. And Mr Speaker, just yesterday, the Financial Times reported that the government is accused of trying to fiddle its emissions exactly. figures, ignoring its official advisers. So let me ask the right honourable gentleman a simple policy question. The Labour Party has committed to banning fracking. Will the government ban fracking and allow new onshore wind in England, yes or no? What, what the government is committed to is to reducing emissions in line with both our domestic and global uh, targets. And we have not just met but we have outperformed our first and second carbon budgets and we are on track towards meeting the third. There is going to be a need for some time into the future to use gas as a transitional fuel, but that is much less polluting than other forms of hydrocarbon-based energy and it therefore is a good source during the transition period while we make ready to move to a completely decarbonised economy. Rebecca Long Bailey. Well, this is absolutely staggering. The government promotes fracking, backed by only 12% of the public, effectively blocks onshore wind, backed by 79% of the public, new solar is down 94%, home insulation is down 98%. Mr Speaker, Parliament declared a climate emergency, yet there is no evidence this government takes this seriously. We need a green industrial revolution to tackle climate change. Yep. And alone, Swansea Tidal Lagoon would have required 100,000 tonnes of steel, mainly from Port Talbot, but the government refused to back it. Yes. Can the right honourable gentleman tell us what the government has actually done since signing the steel charter to support our steel industry? Yes. Mr. Mr Speaker, if one looks at what is actually happening in the real world, rather than the ideological tracts which the Honourable Lady appears to spend her time reading, you will see, Mr Speaker, that there are about 400,000 jobs already in low-carbon businesses and their supply chains throughout the United Kingdom, and scope for much more low-carbon growth to support up to 2 million jobs in the future. We now have received advice from the Independent Climate Change Committee about how to time and to legislate for our transition to a completely decarbonised economy, and we will be bringing forward our decisions later this year as to how and when we will be taking that action. Well, the Independent Climate Change Committee has repeatedly criticised the government's approach to decarbonising our economy, but I know in the Right Honourable Gentleman's response there was not a single word on what support the government will provide the steel industry, and people from Redcar to Scunthorpe know that his empty rhetoric will not solve their catastrophe. Yeah. Mr Speaker, climate change is an existential threat. Yeah. To safeguard our future, we will need to mobilise all of our resources, just like we did when we rebuilt Britain after the Second World War. If we took the challenge seriously, we could create hundreds of thousands of jobs in low carbon industries, reverse decades of decline in our deindustrialised areas, and lead the world in renewable technologies. But the government is letting us down. They have recklessly run the clock down on Brexit. But I say to the right honourable member, isn't it the truth that their failure is now running down the clock on our planet? Mr. Mr Speaker, sir, the Honourable Lady asked about government help for the steel industry. The answer to her question is that we have provided taxpayer-funded subsidies to cut energy costs in the steel industry. We have supported globally and introduced here trade defence measures to shut out unfair competition and dumping from steel. And when I was in Sheffield uh, a few days ago, I talked to specialist steelmakers in South Yorkshire who welcomed this government's commitment there to the Advanced Manufacturing Centre 
to the work that we are doing on technical and vocational training and who were optimistic about the future of steelmaking and manufacturing in this country under the policies that my right honourable friend the Secretary of State for Business has been taking through. Now, the truth is that I, 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 when I looked at the honourable lady's video about the, uh, the Labour Party's new uh, commitment to a, a green, in a term, a green industrial revolution. It concluded with a focus on the word, words about renationalisation, bring back into public ownership, as if that were the way forward. Now we know from the CBI, Mr. Speaker, that the cost of that would be £176 billion taken from the pockets of taxpayers throughout the United Kingdom. That money could be used to build three million new homes. Those Labour policies would put at risk the finances of decent working families in every part of this country. And Marcus Fish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Som Somerset has been helping illustrate the huge national challenge we face in social care through a powerful panorama programme, the final part of which airs uh, tonight. Will my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute to all in caring roles and commit to addressing their funding needs fully? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I first of all thank my honourable friend for highlighting this important issue. We are committed to ensuring that people of all ages have access to the care and support they need. That is why we have given local authorities access to nearly £4 billion more for adult social care this year. But we recognise that we also need to make sure that best practice is observed across all local authorities and NHS trusts, where the evidence is that delayed discharges are higher in some areas than in others. We will be publishing the Green Paper at the earliest opportunity to set out the, to set out the uh, hard strategic choices that are going to face the Government, whoever leads the Government in the months to come, and to uh, describe proposals to ensure that the social care system is sustainable over the longer term. Jesse Blackmullen. Mr Speaker, I wish to associate myself and my SNP colleagues with the comments of others. Our thoughts are with the veterans gathered in Portsmouth today to, commem yeah, yeah, to commemorate yeah. the anniversary of D-Day. Yeah, yeah. Today is also World Environment Day, an important reminder that climate change remains the biggest challenge facing the world. Mm -hmm. And also, I would like to wish a very, very happy Eid Mubarak to all of those celebrating across the UK yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yesterday, Donald Trump said that the NHS was on the table in the trade talks with the UK. Today, he says he's not so sure. This is someone who doesn't even believe in climate change, a president who simply cannot be trusted. Why then is the UK government so obsessed with pursuing a trade deal that puts Scotland's NHS at risk? Mr. Mr Speaker, the Government is not putting the NHS at risk in Scotland or anywhere else, and, and the Prime Minister has made that uh, very clear indeed. What I fear is um, putting at risk standards in the NHS at Scotland is, in Scotland is the SNP's obsession with constitutional matters and a referendum, rather than focusing on the better delivery of public services. Mr Speaker, we have the best performing NHS in the UK. Yeah. The highest number of, with the highest number of GPs per head of population. Yeah. If this week has proven anything, it has proven that there is no guarantee our NHS is safe. In 2014, Westminster promised Scotland's NHS would be in public hands for as long as the people of Scotland wanted it. But now, this Tory government is actively working to deny the Scottish Parliament the powers to safeguard our NHS and protect our public services. The truth is, under this government, Scotland won't have a veto 
We may not even have a say. The Scottish Government will never allow our precious NHS to be signed away in a Tory Trump trade deal. If the Minister and his, if the Minister and his fellow MPs cannot make that same pledge here today, they will never, ever be forgiven. Mr Speaker, the, the risk of repeating myself, the, under this Government and under stewardship of anybody on this side of the House, the NHS is not going to be up for grabs in a trade negotiation with the United States or with anybody else at all. And I would say to the Honourable Lady that when she talks about the need for a voice for Scotland, she ought to have more confidence in the ability of herself and her colleagues to represent the interests of Scotland here in the debates and in the committees on which they sit. At the moment, they're leaving it to my 13 colleagues on this side to be the true voice of Scotland. Mr Speaker, thank you very much. Um, I know from my own personal experience what it takes to win a seat from the Labour Party and hold it. Will my right honourable friend agree with me that every community in this country needs a strong voice in this place and the people of Peterborough tomorrow have the opportunity to elect Paul Bristow yes. to give them that voice yeah. to replace the failed Labour MP who ended up in jail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I very much endorse what my, honourable friend, my right honourable friend says and I believe that in Paul Bristow, Peterborough would have a formidable champion for the interests of the residents of every part of that borough. Or a Pidcock! Mr Speaker, I know that the right honourable gentleman is just a stand-in while the vultures circle, but I want to ask what he thinks of the legacy left by the Prime Minister. A deeply divided country where 14 million people live in poverty, where 130,000 preventable deaths have been caused by our austerity since 2012, a country where 17,000 people can die while they are waiting for disability benefits, where homelessness is soaring, destitution is rife, and a UN rapporteur can describe Britain as defined by harsh and uncaring ethos. I don't want to personalise this because everyone on those benches is responsible, but what kind of legacy is that? Mr Speaker, the legacy of my rightable friend will be a country in which income inequality is down, in which wages have been rising faster than inflation for more than a year, where we have the lowest unemployment since the 1970s and record numbers of people in jobs. And it's about time that the Honourable Lady stop talking our country down on this side. We want to raise our country up. Mr Speaker, does my <laughs> right honourable friend think it's acceptable that people with access to large sums of money are able to bring about private prosecutions in a way that undermines freedom of speech in this country? Um, <laughs> Mr Speaker, I, I, let me say two things about my, uh, my honourable friend's question. For, first of all, I believe that freedom of speech is one of our most precious inheritances from previous generations and we should do everything we can in this place and outside to uphold that principle. When it comes to any specific case, it would clearly be wrong of me to pass comment on something that is before the courts. Jay Stevens. Thank you, Please. Mr Speaker. Last weekend, my constituency suffered yet more serious violent crime, some in the public domain and some which isn't including the murder of 18-year-old Fahad Mohammed Noor and a knife attack on the congregation leaving Dal Dar al Isra Mosque following Ramadan prayers. Since 2010, under Liberal Democrat and Conservative government, South Wales police funding has been cut by nearly £61 million. Police officers in Cardiff are running on empty. What will it take? for this shambles of a government to accept responsibility for public safety and give South Wales Police the funding they desperately yeah. need. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, South Wales Police is actually receiving up to £290 million in funding in the current financial year, which is an increase of £19 million 
on the last financial year, but the, to get to grips with uh, serious crime, and I think no one would have anything but, but sympathy for the victims uh, whom she referred to and their families, we also need to look at what it is that drives young men in particular towards gang membership and participation in violent crime. And that is, and that is the work that my right hon. Friend, the Home Secretary, in partnership with other Ministers, is now leading, and which I hope will bring benefits to her constituency and to many others. Mr. Speaker, the motor industry is vital to the economy of rugby and the West Midlands, and so was the, my right hon. Friend concerned to see that UK manufacturing statistics from the SMMT show that in April production fell by 44% because of factory shutdowns for the unexpected certainty of a 29th of March Brexit. Does he agree that this should act as a wake-up call to ensure that the same thing doesn't happen again on the 31st of October by leaving the EU with a deal which will take away the uncertainty that is so damaging to our manufacturers? I, I think my hon. Friend makes a very important point, and the car industry is one of the most important, but by no means the only sector in this country that relies heavily upon just-in-time cross-border supply chains with enterprises in other member states of the European Union. That is why the Government remains focused on ensuring that our departure from the EU is smooth and orderly and with a deal which allows for those just-in-time supply chains to be protected. Benicook. Mr Speaker, of the many collective challenges we face, none is more essential, more urgent than climate breakdown. The legislation required to commit the UK to phasing out carbon emissions entirely by mid-century is simple, it's almost certainly already been drafted, and this House could pass it in a matter of days. This issue is simply too pressing to wait for later this year or a future administration. We have the parliamentary time. What possible uh, reason can the Minister give for why the government cannot commit to enshrine net zero emissions into law now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, may I have first of all congratulate the honourable gentleman and his partner uh, on having looked at his Twitter feed on the, uh, the uh, imminent uh, birth of their, their second child later this year. I wish, wish both he and his partner well. Uh, in, in terms of his question, it was this government which actually went to the Independent Committee on Climate Change and asked for advice from them about how and over what time frame to make that move to complete decarbonisation. We have only very recently received that advice. That will clearly need to be uh, considered within government, and we want to bring forward our decision at the earliest possible opportunity because I share his view of the importance of getting on with this. Ms Green. Mr Speaker, difficult times often call for new leadership and a new vision. Therefore, will my right hon. Friend join me in supporting Councillor David Greenhouse's vision for a regeneration of Bolton, his bids for the future High Street Fund, and the recovery of Bolton after 40 years of Labour misrule. I would like to thank my hon. Friend for uh, highlighting this uh, uh, initiative in, in Bolton. As he knows, uh, you know, high streets are changing, and, and we are committed as a government to helping communities like Bolton to adapt to that change. We have already set in hand the £675 million Future High Streets Fund. We welcome Bolton Council's applications. It being, they are being assessed alongside other applications. We will make an announcement about those places that are successful later this summer. I know my honourable friend will continue to be a very doughty champion for his city. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My local NHS is cutting GP hours. While they and NHS England are forced to subsidise a private company, Babylon GP at Hand, which has sucked up over 50,000 patients for its controversial app-based system, undermining GPs across London and beyond. Given the Health Secretary is Babylon's biggest cheerleader, why should my constituents trust this government to keep the NHS public any more than they would trust Donald Trump? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, an NHS England is, I understand, increasing the baseline funding of Hammersmith and Fulham uh, CCG to ensure it is not financially disadvantaged by hosting GP at hand. But the, the NHS 
to improve its service to patients is going to need to embrace innovation and digital technologies like those used by GP at hand do offer convenience for patients and often allow clinicians to work more efficiently. And that is why our new GP contract gives everyone the right to digital first primary care, including web and video consultations from 2021, if that is what they want to receive. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, 75 years ago tonight, the first steps in the liberation of Europe were taken by the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry uh, when they dropped by parachute to liberate Pegasus Bridge. Uh, as the Dakotas over Normandy commemorate this feat um, at this present time, will my right honourable friend uh, join with me to celebrate and commemorate all the ordinary and yet extraordinary men and women from every corner of our country who turned the tide of the war in freedom's favour? Uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for, for highlighting the particular example of the Pegasus Bridge and the heroism shown by the servicemen from our two counties. Um, but I think he's also right that we need to pay tribute today to the men and women who took part in the success of Operation Overlord for whichever part of the United Kingdom or for whichever allied country they came. Far too many people in our uniformed public services are taking their own lives. But, Mr Speaker, we don't know the true extent of these tragedies, as ministers do not require this data to be collected. Will the minister agree with me that the police, our armed forces and the prison services should follow the lead of the fire service and record the number of people in their service that take their own lives? Uh, I mean, the, the Honourable Gentleman makes a... A good point. I know he is due to meet with uh, Minister of Justice uh, ministers fairly soon to talk about whether the, um, the MOJ could introduce similar practices uh, for its services. And I will draw his question to the attention of the Minister for Policing to see if a comparable meeting can be established with the Home Office. Joseph Johnson. Mr. Speaker, Pets Wood has designated an area of special residential character in the London Borough of Bromley but it suffered from inconsistent decision-making at the hands of the Planning Inspectorate, which I feel is unaccountable. Would my right honourable friend use his good offices to help me secure the meeting I've long been requesting, which the Planning Inspectorate has for some reason consistently declined? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy in the first instance to ensure that my honourable friend has a meeting with the, the relevant minister in the Department of Housing, Communities and Local Government and hope that that will enable him to find a way forward. It would be a gross discourtesy if it were otherwise. <laughs> Extraordinary that the honourable gentleman should have to ask for a meeting, but there we are, he's going to get his meeting. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, yeah. Mr Speaker. Well, yesterday the US President did say that the NHS was on the table of any trade negotiation and the PM did not intervene to stop him. The Lib Dems and Tories have already voted through the Health and Social Care Act, which opened up the NHS to the US market. 10% is already privatised. And the Brexit Party leader has no issue with US private health care insurance replacing our NHS. No party can be trusted with our NHS except the Labour Party. Yeah. Isn't Labour now the only hope to save our NHS? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, one does get a bit sick of these scare stories after a while. The, um, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady might like to pretend that the majority of NHS contracting out for private sector did not actually take place under Conservative administration, but under the Labour government, with, with Andy Burnham urging that to be accelerated. Now, the truth is that during the 70-year uh, lifetime of the NHS, it has had more years under Conservative than under Labour stewardship. And if we look at what is happening today, we see the NHS getting the biggest cash boost ever in its history, a long-term plan for its future made possible by Conservative policies. Mr Douglas Ross. 
very much, Mr Speaker, and I remind the House of my members' interests. I echo what the Minister said about our teams going to the World Cup and their performances later on this month, but there is further representation from this country, with three match officials selected, Shan Massey and Lisa Rashid from England, and my colleague from Scotland, Kylie Coburn, all selected to represent their country. So will my right hon. Friend join me in congratulating them for their dedication, commitment and ability as match officials, which has seen them called up to the World Cup, and wish all our match officials a successful and uh, productive tournament. Yeah. Well, I, I, did, I did feel it was perhaps uh, you know, the, the shop steward for the amalgamated <laughs> union of um, uh, association football officials was, was, was speaking there. But uh, the, um, I, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in congratulating Sean, Lisa and Kylie as having been selected as assistant referees. It is a first-class achievement, and I'd like to wish them, as well as both teams, all success for the World Cup. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pupils from St Gregory's Primary School in my constituency recently wrote to me regarding the problem of plastic pollution in our environment. They have rightly pointed out the damage that plastic waste <laughs> causes to marine life and also human life as it makes its way up the food chain. As a result, they are calling on the government to introduce a deposit return scheme that will reduce the amount of plastic that ends up in landfill and in our oceans. On this World Environment Day, does the Minister agree with the pupils of St Gregory's Primary School? Yeah. Um, the, I think that I can uh, give uh, the Honourable Lady an encouraging message to take back to the pupils of St Gregory's School, which is that under the leadership of my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for the Environment, the Government has uh, launched a resources and waste strategy which includes consulting on plans to introduce consistent recycling for all households and consulting on a deposit return scheme to drive up the recycling of cans and bottles and plans for producers to pay the full cost of managing packaging waste through extended producer responsibility. Uh, makes a good package. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thirty years ago this week, some 2,000 Democrats, maybe more, we will never know the number, were murdered in Tiananmen Square. And even now in China, there is a great firewall which prevents Wikipedia, Google, and others communicating with the Chinese people. Now, while China has moved on, does my right honourable friend not think it the height of hypocrisy those who demonstrated against the President of the United States of America? yet chose not to demonstrate against the President of China when he came here. I think that uh, my honourable friend makes a telling point about the um, inconsistency in standards that we have seen from some leading members of this House. It is indeed 30, it was 30 years yesterday since the tragic shocking events in which so many people lost their lives while protesting peacefully in and around Tiananmen Square. And the sad truth today is that people in China are still unable to exercise their right to protest peacefully, a right given to them by international agreements to which the Chinese government has signed up. And we continue to urge the Chinese government to respect citizens' freedom of association, assembly, expression, and other fundamental rights and freedoms, as is supposed to be enshrined in China's constitution as well as in international law. Roberts. And I would like to tell the House that Plaid Cymru leader Adam Price is in is celebrating it with the, the Normandy memor memorial today, and that we yeah, share yeah. the feeling for all those people who remember that historical event. Now, I guess when President Trump's visit was thought up months ago, the plan was for the UK to have left the EU by then. <laughs> Take back control, they said. But what we saw this week was a vision of things to come, of razzle-dazzle concealing the reality of sovereignty reduced to sycophancy. 68% yeah. 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 of Welsh exports, Mr Speaker, go to the EU. Only 14% of Welsh exports go to the US. Post-Brexit, 
the British government will have to choose which deal to strike. Yeah. Which would he prioritise? Yeah. 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 Mr. Mr. Speaker, if the Honourable Lady had been studying the various publications from the government, she will have seen that our objective is to have a very close deep future partnership on trade and other matters with our neighbours in the European Union, while at the same time having the freedom to pursue trade deals with other parts of the world, including with the United States uh, um, amongst one. And I, I just do ask the Honourable Lady to just pause um, before condemning the state visit by the elected head of state and government of our staunchest ally at a time when we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings and trying to criticise that for political purposes. We can disagree with President Trump. Any of us is free to do that, but he is here as the elected head of state of our staunch, consistent ally, and we should honour and respect him during that visit. Speaker, I know my right hon. Friend will be aware from his recent visit to Cornwall of the potential of development of the space sector in Cornwall, and therefore I am sure he would join me in welcoming the announcement yesterday of government support of £7.8 million for the development of Europe's first horizontal spaceport in Cornwall. So would he join me in congratulating all the Spaceport Cornwall team for their successful bid? Would he use his offices to ensure that the government does everything it can to make sure the regulations are in place for satellites to be launched as soon as possible? And while he's on his feet, would he congratulate the Cornish rugby team for their excellent win on Sunday against Cheshire to become county championship? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to congratulate the Cornish rugby team, as my honourable friend invites me to do. And I was also very pleased indeed to see the decision being made to give that support to the uh, Cornwall Spaceport Initiative. I remember very vividly uh, meeting representatives of the spaceport during my visit to the Goon Hilly Earth Station earlier this year, and I think there are some really exciting commercial opportunities available for Cornwall and the United Kingdom. Mr. Speaker, in July 2016, my constituent, Mr. Goff, was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a form of blood cancer. He was treated with two lines of chemotherapy and initially responded well but had recurrent infections which required antibiotics. He went into remission in 2018 and his PIP was stopped in December 2018. Mr Goff appealed the decision despite the fact that he was receiving treatment his appeal was refused. In February he was told his cancer had relapsed. It is incurable. He has now been told his mobility car will be repossessed this week. Removing his PIP left him, will leave him short of money, unable to get to most of his daily appointments and at risk of infection when travelling on public transport. Can I appeal to everybody on those benches over there, show some compassion, someone intervene and stop this injustice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the I mean, the Honourable Member will, appreci will appreciate that I don't know any more about the detail of his constituents' case than what he has just uh, set out before the House. Uh, my right hon. Friend, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions is in her place on the front bench, will have heard what he said, and I shall ask her to make sure that a minister from that department speaks to the hon. Gentleman urgently to get to the bottom of what has happened. Um, Mr Speaker, the National Readership Challenge launches today, and can I particularly recommend to colleagues the conclusions on further education in the Government's post-18 education review to reverse the decline of core spending, to increase the unit funding rate and to allow for three-year funding plans. Does my right honourable friend agree that this should be essential reading for Treasury Ministers before the autumn spending review and that more funding for further education would be very welcome? Um, Mr Speaker, my, my honourable friend makes a very important point about the vital role that further education provides, both in equipping young men and women with uh, skills they need to give them good career opportunities, but also often as providing a passport through to higher education at a later stage in their careers. The Augur Review provides a blueprint of how we can make sure that everybody can follow the path that is right for them, and he's right to say that we need to study Augur's conclusions carefully in the run-up to the forthcoming spending review. Mr Speaker, Police Scotland uh, prepared a report 
on extraordinary rendition flights stopping through Scottish airports for the Crown Office. Counter-terrorism officers and the Lord Advocate have made clear that they require full access to the unredacted Senate Intelligence Committee report from the United States Government, but they have so far refused to do so, and therefore it is prohibiting them determining whether or not a crime was committed. So, given intelligence sharing is supposed to underpin our relationship with the US, has anyone from the government raised this with President Trump whilst he's been here? And if not, will he pledge to do so on behalf of Scotland's law enforcement agencies before he departs UK soil today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, unsurprisingly, uh, in line with President, under all governments, I am not prepared to discuss security intelligence matters on the floor of the House, but I will draw the Honourable Gentleman's question to the attention of those of my colleagues in government who are directly responsible for these areas of policy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My thoughts today are with my 94-year-old stepfather, who has once again returned to Normandy yeah. to remember that it was soldiers, sailors and airmen from not only the UK and the US, but allies, especially all over the Commonwealth who fought for our lives. And can we use this moment to thank them, to thank those who serve in our armed forces today, and to thank our Prime Minister, who in her last few days in this job is serving our country with great dignity. Yeah. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for her question, and I'm sure that she will be able to take back to her stepfather a salute from the entire House for the service of himself and his comrades uh, on, uh, in Normandy 75 years ago. I agreed with every word that my honourable friend said. And finally, Carl Turner. Thank you. Mr Speaker, 12 months ago the Prime Minister told this House that she wanted a speedy resolution to the funding row between NHS England and Vertex for the drug Ocambi to treat cystic fibrosis. My seven-year-old constituent, Oliver Ward, wrote to the Prime Minister recently asking what progress she's made. Could the Minister please give Oliver some good news and tell him that he needn't get up every day worrying about this terrible injustice? Yeah. 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 Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, I shall ask the Health Secretary, one of his team, to contact the Honourable Gentleman at the earliest opportunity to try and give Oliver uh, the, the news that he wishes for. Uh, yes, very well. Uh, point of order. Uh, point of order, Mr Martin Doherty Hughes. Uh, Mr. It relates to matters that can't wait until after the urgent questions, not because of the fullness of the Honourable Gentleman's diary, but because the matter appertains to exchanges that have just taken place? Oh, very good. Point of order, Mr Martin Doherty Hughes. Uh, Mr Speaker, in a, a day in which we commemorate the freedom of Europe, it has come to my attention the weekend that a fellow member of the Council of Europe, the Georgian State,